It's a pleasure today to have uh, Randy uh, Kenyon to give our uh, colloquium. Randy is well known to those who know him well. Uh, somebody <laughs> who often knows who he's talking about. Uh, Randy has worked on. on um, you, you got to turn it to a Randy's no, trying his, his hand in the experiment. Randy works in the image in the uh, theory of um, topics involving topology and geometry, from packing to uh, membranes to liquid crystals. Um, he got his degree from Caltech and his PhD from Harvard. He was at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Penn. And um, he's going to talk today about Smetic's explanation. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I've had a pleasant day so far. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm always allowed, I understand that you're allowed to change your title, so I added to make it more interesting, pure applied smectics. Um, my original um, abstract was considered too jargony, so you saw the new abstract sounded fun and light and happy. Um, so let's see what we can do. Is there a way to turn all the lights off? I, I know how to do it. I'll press this button that says off. <laughs> Okay. Okay, good. So, I'm going to tell you about smectic liquid crystals. And I'm going to tell it to you in a way that if you didn't know what they were before, I hope you will now, um, or afterwards. But I want you to see, this is what a smectic liquid crystal looks like in a real experiment. So, you follow some recipe, you, you make some molecule, and you uh, smear it on a slide, and you look at it under a microscope, and you see this. Now look what you see. You see ellipses. Okay? And those are ellipses. And sometimes you see the ellipses, and sometimes there are pieces of hyperbola, sometimes there are even pieces of parabola. And these are perfect. These are really nice ellipses. And these points where the light's coming out, that's one of the foci. That's a focus of the ellipse. Okay? <laughs> and the question is, why are you seeing that? Right? And what does this have to do with liquid crystals, the kind you see in displays? Well, they're all related. And this is the typical texture you see. It's not organized. So let me give you a little historical account of liquid crystals. They're, you know, 120, 150 years old. Um, they were discovered by Reinitzer. Oops. Oops. Come on. Go backwards. Okay. They were discovered by Reinitzer and characterized by Lehmann, which is why they have all these crazy names. There's, liquid crystals are phases of matter. There are other phases. They're not fluids. They're not solids. Um, and there's a language thing that I know that Paul will agree with me about. I'm going to call the phase liquid crystal, and I'm going to call the molecules liquid crystals also, just like colloids. Okay? And so here is a liquid crystal molecule. It's, you think of it as a rod. I think of it as a rod. You can think of it as a rod, too. All right? And what happens is that at first, you get this phase where the rods just fall down any which way. So not only are the centers of masses random, so it's a fluid, it's not a crystal, there's no periodic order, the directions are also random. But the liquid crystal is neat because you can concentrate it, or you can lower the temperature, and it'll start to line up. The molecule centers are still random. It's still a fluid, except now it's a fluid that has a direction in it. And because there's a direction in it, it can transmit a torque. If I had this whole room filled with this liquid crystal and it were all aligned in this pneumatic phase, I could twist this side and that side would twist with it. And I could twist it slowly. It's not like how, you know, an automatic transmission works. I could twist it very slowly and we twist over there. And that's not the case for water. If this room were filled with water, if I did this, nothing would happen over there, if I did it slowly. Okay? And you can have the other kind of pneumatic, uh, what do you call these? You call these plain M&Ms, Paul? You can have pneumatics made of plain M&Ms or peanut M&Ms, where instead of having them be rods, they're discs. Those are more like some more rings. Okay. All right, what are these like? These are like adamant. Right? Okay. <laughs> So what happens is you cool the system more, you concentrate it, you get something that starts to be like a crystal. And what you get is you get these phases called smectics. Smectic comes from the Greek word for soap, um, smegmos, 
And the Greek word for soap, it's interesting. Ivory soap means a smectic. If you dissolve it in water, it actually does this. So a smectic is something where the molecules are all oriented in some particular direction. And um, they start making layers. In each layer, there are fluids. If I look down from the top, the centers are just random. So they're fluids from the point of view of two-dimensional layers. But the layers are stacked neatly. It's like a very messily stacked deck of cards, right? Or a messily stacked pad of paper. All right? And so here's the weird thing. If you push the paper on the top, the paper on the bottom doesn't move. For the same reason, they can't transmit shear. But they can transmit shear across. Again, if this room were filled with smectic and the layers were pointing so that their normals were up and down in this room, if I tried to lift this layer, move all the layers up over here, they'd move up over there also. Or if you imagine these walls made of smectic and they were like Samson, right? You push this wall and that wall will move with it or not, okay? And there are various variants of the smectics. They are not named in the order they were discovered, so there's gaps, like there's smectic, there's no smectic B, and there's smectic X, and smectic F, and I, and L, but not all the letters are there. Um, but I'm going to talk about these. So, what do liquid crystals look like when you look at them? So I already showed you the picture of the smectic. This is what a pneumatic looks like. All right, and these fine lines are where the word nema, pneumatic came from. They mean threads. And this is under cross polarizers, and I'll explain in a little bit. This is called a Schlieren texture, which just means uh, like streak, right? Or mess. It's you know, just a mess. Okay. Here is a picture of some DNA that makes a liquid crystal. It makes a chiral liquid crystal, and it makes layers. And you can see that it makes layers because it's opalescent. Right? So it refracts light in different directions, right? depending on you know, the orientation of the stacks. Here is a cholesteric liquid crystal, which is very similar to, but not exactly the same as a smectic. It is something where we have some periodic order. And there are cross polarizers, and so you see stripes, and I'll get back to that. Here is another smectic that's much more nicely organized. And again, you get this periodicity. By the way, these pictures are taken with a microscope. Okay? And this microscope is like the kind you can buy at Toys R Us. Okay? And these microscopes, that means the picture's, you know, 100 microns big. Right? It's the same micro. Right? And, and <clears throat> that means that these stripes are maybe a micron apart. So you ask yourself, what can molecules, the molecules that make these liquid crystals up are usually a few phenyl rings or something. They make structures, they're molecules that are a few nanometers big, and they make structures that are micron periodicity. Where does that length scale come from? That's a mystery. I mean, we have theories. We have theories that explain why it should be big, but no good theory of why they should be as big as they are, or how to predict them. <clears throat> There's another phase, which I won't talk about very much. It's called the blue phase. The blue phase, this thing you're looking at, I know you think it's a crystal. Who thinks it's a crystal? <laughs> no one. John, you're blocking the light. Okay. <laughs> All right. so, so this has facets, like a crystal has facets. It grows with the wolf construction, all that stuff. But this is a liquid. The thing that's crystalline is not where the molecules sit, but which way they point. And they're organized in three dimensions into a structure of how they point in every... So in that plot, the molecules know how to point, and it's a 3D modulation of the orientation, not of the density. All right? And can anyone tell me at what wavelength or what length scale that um, modulation is? Blue. Blue, but you know it's a liquid, so you got to change a little bit. Right? Yeah, bluish. Exactly. But there are red-blue phases and green-blue phases. All right? There's lots of colors. This is a smectic. These are called focal conic fan-like textures. And you start to see things, if you look carefully and use your imagination, that look like those ellipses that I was talking about. And we'll explain that later. So let's go back to the Schlieren texture, the first thing that people saw. This is pneumatic. It's in two dimensions. Your eyes go immediately to the fact that there are these black lines. And not only are there black lines, but there are black lines that come together 
at fourfold junctions, and sometimes at twofold junctions. And you ask yourself, what are you looking at? So this is the setup. It's a very simple setup. You have are these uh, le are incandescent lights illegal in New York? No. Um, it, oh, only big sodas. <laughs> so here's this incandescent. Here's this light. And you have a polarizer, and you have another polarizer, which you call the analyzer because it's perpendicular to it. <coughs> and um, then you have these little crystal molecules in between. The molecules, you do some chemistry, you get them to lie in the plane of the polarizer and the analyzer. So you have two planes. Now what happens if light goes through and there were no liquid crystal there? What do you see? You see nothing, right? No light gets through because they're cross-polarizers. But these molecules are not only long rods physically, they're long rods from the point of view of light. They are birefringent. And they have different dielectric constants along the long axis and perpendicular to the long axis. And so, what happens? Light comes in. If the molecule is pointing in some generic direction, it breaks the light up into the ordinary wave and the extraordinary wave which move at different phase velocities, and they get to the other side, and they haven't canceled. And so some light gets through. They don't cancel. They don't come out in the same polarization that they started in. So when the molecules are lying in the plane, light gets through. I'm, you know, the, uh, yeah. I'm confused about the two dimensions. And the, 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 uh, what, what are these orientations? I mean, there's a, there are these two planes defined by the planes. Yes. Now, what is the plane defined by the pneumatics in two dimensions? It's the same plane. So they all lie, the molecules, through the chemistry on the surface, the molecules all lie tangent to Those the planes. two planes. Exactly. And the two planes are parallel. Now, if it should be that the molecule happens to point along the polarizer direction, then there's only an ordinary wave that comes in. The light comes in, you're only getting one dielectric constant, because one of those one of the light, one of the polarization is already extinguished, and it goes through the other side with the polarization unchanged. Okay? And when that happens, you get black. Everyone with me? Yeah. So the black lines are precisely the places where the molecules are either pointing up and down or left and right. Right? So the black lines, in mathematics words, you say this is the pre-image of these two directions. This tells you any place where the molecule is either along the polarizer or the analyzer, you get a black line. So what I'm going to tell you is those places where four things come together come from these things that are topological defects, vortices. Here's a vortex. This is the kind you might imagine where the molecules go around, and at the center you don't know which way they point, just like you know one of those uh, pole coordinates. Okay, which way does the thing point in the center? But there's other kinds like this, which looks more like an elongational shear flow. Here's one where everything's sticking out, here's something else. These are all situations where if you look, the molecule rotates around by 2 pi as you go around. So, what would you see under cross polarizers? Well, I would see Everywhere where the molecules are along the polarizing direction, I'd see a black line. So here, I would see a black line going up and down. I also get a black line wherever they're parallel to the analyzer. So I'll get a black line, I don't know, kind of like this. Right? And so, what happens? You get four black lines each time. Why four? Because as the molecule rotates by 2 pi, it has to, because when you get back, it's the same molecule. Sorry, I, I missed this part because I was late, but what if it just rotates pi when you go along? Well, I haven't gotten there yet, but they can do that. Okay, right. right. <coughs> if they, they have to rotate so that they're back to where they were. If they rotate by 2 pi, they're certainly back to where they were. Okay. So, you get four brushes because it goes through the polarizer direction twice and the analyzer direction twice. And of course, Tycho guessed. You also see these ones where there's two. And when there's two, it's more exciting because that means that they only rotate around by pi. So without 
knowing anything about the molecules with no electron diffraction or you know high resolution scattering or whatever technology you want. I already know that the molecule and the molecule pointing the other way are the same. Because here, I can go once in the polarizer direction and once in the analyzer direction. I can only rotate around one pi, not two pi. And when I rotate around one pi, the system still knows what to do. The molecules are still pointing in the same direction. So without knowing anything about the molecule, I now know that the molecules, or this phase, have this up-down symmetry. That the molecule pointing this way and this way is the same. All right? To me, that's beautiful. I look at a micron-sized picture between polarizers that were invented in the 1830s, okay, by Bio, the same Bio, right? Bio Savar are two people, right? Is that right? Bio and Savar are two different people. Right, so Bio is the one who uh, who invented who invented this. Okay. Does that have a general question? So you mentioned all the various phases earlier. Yeah. So are these all the same molecules for different external conditions? Like different the temperatures. Yes, or there are molecules. Molecules themselves both. are different. Both. Both. But there are many molecules that go through mm -hmm. all the phases. Mm -hmm. There are molecules, but you know, I picked the ones that give you the best. So, this is cool. I look at the topology of these defects, and I can tell you things about the geometry of the molecules. You can have higher charges, too. We have lots of brushes. Here you have, oops, here you have a situation where you, it looks like you have six brushes. It's a lie, because this brush goes back on itself. But here's one where you really do have eight brushes, and here's one where you really do have ten brushes. And if you have eight brushes, it means it goes around four pi times. And if you have ten brushes, it means it goes around uh, five pi, uh, five pi, oh, I'm sorry, twelve brushes. It means it goes around six pi times. So you can have winding and multiple winding. And the cool thing is all you need to do is count how many brushes come out of the defect. You count the number of brushes, that tells you the charge of the defect. Right? If 10 brushes come out, it must have rotated around by uh, 5 pi. All right? If 22 brushes come out, 11 pi. <clears throat> so that's neat because it means I don't even have to resolve it. I don't even have to have a good microscope. I can just count all the brushes on the outside. The charges add. They add just like electric charges. And in fact, if you get really excited about it, you can look in the book that we like to refer to as Tom Lubensky's book, on uh, condensed matter physics. <laughs> and um, you can then calculate the energetic interaction between these charges, and you find out they're logarithmic. Just like, just like uh, electric charges in the plane. You think, isn't that great? Right? We've mapped yet another problem to electrostatics. Right? And once you understand electrostatics, it, you will profoundly understand physics. It's like waves. Okay? So, what about the symmetric? So the symmetric is this layered system. I should have said that cell membranes make symmetrics too. You get these ice cream sandwiches of ice cream, you know, oily ice cream and charged cookie, right? And the charged cookie is floating in water, and they make these nice stacks. And for my purposes, I'm going to describe the symmetric by saying a symmetric is a level set, or if you like the electrostatic word for level set, equipotential, right, of some function phi. When phi is zero, that's the first layer. When phi is a, it's the next layer. When it's 2a, it's the following layer. You notice that if I have a function phi of x, y, z, and I solve that, the layers will never cross into each other. So this is a good way of representing multiple surfaces. <clears throat> the other thing is, is I can then say there's a density wave, which is proportional to cosine of that phi, so the layers sit at the peaks. I can write down the normal to the surfaces. Right? Remember, grad phi is perpendicular to, to the equipotentials, the electric field, the perpendicular potentials. This is the unit normal. And I can write down some energy. This is the last time I'm ever going to write down an energy. All right? Because I'm interested in the ground states. And all I care about is these two terms. This term tells me that the layers are equally spaced. The grad phi wants to be magnitude one. <clears throat> the other is the bending energy. It's telling me how much energy it costs to bend the layers. 
The ground state is a state where the layers are equally spaced and don't bend. Deck of cards. But now, of course, what I'm going to do to you is I'm going to put them in a more complicated geometry where they can't make a deck of cards. And I'm going to say, what happens? How does the system deal with that? <clears throat> now, these smectics, you notice, there's these layers, but they also have this normal. The normal points in some direction. The normal is just like the nomadic. The nomadic order that we talked about, that sub vector, you notice that the normal doesn't know which way it points. These layers are up, down, symmetric. So you can ask yourself, can smectics also have defects like nomadics? Remember the defects I just showed you? They can. But there's a theorem. So they can make defects. So here's a situation where you have the layers going around in a circle. And you see at the center, <coughs> the normal to the layers doesn't know which way to point. So it wraps around by two pi. Look at here, this guy here, right? Here's a situation where the normal, you say, oh, as you go around from, you go, let's see, here you are on the top, and you go around, and now you're pointing down. Oops. So the normal rotated by pi as I go around that point. Here's one where nothing happens. Here's one where it rotates by minus pi, not plus pi, relative to the orientation I'm going. Right? I have to pick an orientation to go around the circle. But there's a theorem, and I know there are mathematicians in the room, and they probably know what the theorem means. Right? The theorem basically says you can have a plus one defect, and a half, and a nothing, and a minus a half, and a minus one, and a minus three halves. You can keep going. You can have minus two, and minus five halves, and all that. But you can't ever go plus plus one. You can't have a plus two defect. That's right. And <clears throat> this has to do with the thing that it has to always have layers. And you know, this really bothered us. We didn't under I mean we could read the theorem, we could read each step in the theorem, but that didn't mean we understood the theorem. And then on top of it, it really bothered us in a much more profound way. It meant that you couldn't add defects together. I just showed you in the nomadic I could by counting brushes. And they add it together like charges, and you can look at Lubensky at all and see that <laughs> it's how it's how charges add, charges just add. But we we started playing with it, and we made a much simpler system. Well, no, it's the same one, a two-dimensional system. So we have a two-dimensional smectic that lives in this x-y plane, okay? And I had that phi field, which I said equipotentials of. <laughs> phi, I'm going to draw as a graph, as a function over the x-y plane. It's a surface. This is not the smectic surface. This surface is just a made-up surface living in three dimensions, above the x-y plane. Okay? Equipotentials, or level sets, here's what I call level sets. You intersect this surface with the set phi equals zero, and you get this line. I can do it with phi equals one. I get the next line. So the way that I get the layers of the smectic is I just take level sets of uh, that green surface. And so, what is it? There's another word for this. This is a topographical map. And topographical maps are smectics. In fact, it's one to one. Every smectic is a topographical map. Every topographical map is a smectic. Topographical maps have this nice property that the lines don't cross, just like smectics. The layers don't have to be equally spaced. I'm not worried about a ground state. I'm only worried about the topology. The layers don't cross. There's something else about maps, or topographical maps that's cool. You know that you're at the top or the bottom by every which way you look is down, or every which way you look is up. And that means that there's a contour line that circles around you. If you're at a peak or at a basin, a contour line circles around you. Those are plus one defects. That's a place where the director field rotates around 2 pi as you go around in the same direction. Notice that peaks and basins are the same charge. Now, there's a theorem in Morse theory. You don't even know, it's a theorem in calculus, okay? It's called, it's called it's a theorem that says that between every two mountain peaks, there's a mountain pass. It's called the mountain pass theorem. 
<laughs> and the mountain pass, look at that. That's a place where the director rotates, but it rotates the wrong way around. It rotates by minus 2 pi. If you go around counterclockwise, you will just see that the director rotates clockwise by 2 pi. That's the minus 1 defect. So the minus 1, there's always a minus 1 between 2 plus 1s. So now imagine that I try to take 2 plus 1 defects, bring them together, to make that plus 2, which I can do in a matter. Well, and I bring them together, this mountain pass is always with them. There's minus one defects always there. I can't ever avoid the mountain pass. In other words, if you put a mountain on top of a mountain, it's still just a mountain. Right? In, in Los Angeles, what they do, if they want to make more space, is they cut the tops off of two mountains and make one big plateau. But that's just one mountain now. Right? You had to remove the pass and the two mountains. Okay? Where I'm from, in the Midwest, where there's no mountains, they make mountains out of trash. It's true. Okay? They pile it up and then they put dirt on top of it and you go skiing. Okay? And, and they can do that too. They can take two little mountains and they can fill it in with more stuff. And then also remove the pass. But now you also only have one mountain. So you can never put a mountain on top of a mountain. You can do something weird. Some of you I know have gone to Aspen. Some of you would like to go to Aspen. The best part of Aspen is a place called Electric Pass. Electric Pass is a place when you go hiking where there are three valleys going out from one single pass. Okay? You go three ways. So there are three mountains. Usually if you have three mountains, you have three passes between each pair. But there's nothing that prevents you from having one single pass that goes into those three valleys. That's why you can have any negative charge, right? A, three, a, a, a pass into three valleys would be minus three halves. But you can't have any positive charge. You can't put mountains on mountains. So that's the difference. All right? And so this is a problem. Let me tell you why it's a problem. <clears throat> Usually when we talk about topological defects, we say, what do we do? We have a sample that has defects. We have some ground state manifold. This is all the possible ground states. When we go around some loop in the sample, we go around some loop in the manifold of ground states, if the manifold of ground states is, you know, complicated enough, it has handles. If it has a handle, it's possible to get trapped on the handle. And then there's no way to smoothly go from the situation where I'm caught on the, on the handle of this thing. This is called a climb bagel. And, um, and the place where I'm not caught. I can't contract this thing. It's trapped on the handle. And there's this whole beautiful theory called homotopy theory that allows you to discuss how maps behave from closed circles here to closed paths here. And you can classify topological defects by talking about maps from this group to that group. This is the group of loops. Well, groups have this interesting property. What's the definition of the group? John? <laughs> Okay, I'll give you one thing. It has to have an identity. That's boring. You, you do that. Okay. And everything has to have an inverse. You do that too. Uh -huh. But what's the most important thing about a group? Everything that I operate on comes back into the group again. Yes, you can take two elements and multiply them together or add them or whatever you want to call it and get a new element of the group. Well, if the topological defects are classified by maps from one group to another, I've got a problem because I can't add two plus one defects together. If I try to take two plus ones, I don't get something new. Right? And that means that group theory fails to characterize the defects in a smack day. So homotopy theory, which is the standard practice, doesn't work. It's okay. This works. Thinking about tube surfaces works. All right? It's just, it's not appropriate anymore to use the standard tools. You have to use this thing, which is, you know, some kind of sloppy version of Morse theory, I guess. <clears throat> but, Smectics can have another kind of defect, which I haven't told you about yet. They're a kind of defect that you learn about in regular crystals. They're called dislocations. 
right? This location is a, a very fit, fond of dislocations. I'm sure there are buildings on this campus that are like this. So there's like a pre-war building, I mean World War II, and a post-war building, and they're attached. But I don't know, there used to be more space for the pipes in the pre-war buildings, and you know, people were taller back then, right? I mean, look, look at time. <laughs> and so, you know, they have, they have taller people, and they need more space, and so you attach this pre-war building to this post-war building, and you get this extra floor. And you have this problem, you know, you go, you're walking around on the first floor, and you take the elevator up. No, it's only two stories. Here, you're supposed to walk. Right, to save energy. So you walk up two floors, and you walk over here to the new building, which is all neat and glassy looking, and you go down two stories, and you end up here. You started here, and you ended there, your location has been messed up, you've been dislocated, all right? You don't know where you are, right? And those are real things, okay? And you can, and, and this floor is always called the mezzanine, right? They say one, this is two, three, and they give an extra name. Right? There are, there's a whole building at Penn which is devoted just to connecting all the different buildings together. Right? It's all stairwells and elevators. Right? And when you look at it, if you like lay on your back, it looks like one of those impossible Escher things. <laughs> so, dislocations happen. And these are the kind of defects that you see in crystals. They're a different kind of defect. They're not a defect where I don't know which way the director points the normal points. There are defects where I don't know what the value of phi is. So this is a place that violates the rules. It's a place where my rule is violated. The layers do cross. But there's a way around this. Okay? And the way around it is, instead of saying that that surface that lived above the XY domain, that green surface, lived on the real line, it can live on a circle. So I can go up a thousand feet and come back to where I started. All the stuff in between is different, but a thousand feet is the same as zero feet. So I can have a periodic thing. It's Fourier series. So I'm going to show you what would happen. I'm going to start with a nice helicoid. This doesn't work for my mountain. If this were my mountain range, we'd have a problem because if I took level sets way out here, they would all crash into each other. I don't have layers anymore. On the other hand, this would be a nice ground state. This would be a mountain that's the ground state of my spectrum. Just a, a plane and an angle. And then when you take level sets of it, you get equally spaced layers. So I'm going to mix the two together. Okay. So here's a helicoid. And I'm going to stretch it. I stretch it in a funny way. It's still periodic in the z direction. So when you go from here to here, that's really the same place. Right? It goes on forever. So I'm saying this and this and this and this and this and this. They're all the same place. And you say, why are you telling me this? Here's the helicoid, the tilted helicoid. Watch as I take sections of it. Level sets. There's software that does this. Okay? You ready? I keep going. Look. Do you see the dislocation? Two extra layers. When you cut a helicoid at an angle, you get dislocations. Right? And you can keep going to get the other geometry. Okay, so helicoids fix this. We can actually have dislocations and disclinations all in one story by having mountain ranges uh, uh, on circles. Okay? And there's like a mathematical thing. I think it's called morse novikov theory or something, which is probably, would probably be useful for us to learn. Okay, <laughs> to, uh, to, to study this more. But we have what we want. There are some extra things that once you start talking about the surface, you realize something cool about the surface, which is the normal to the surface, the only thing that controls the spacing is the direction of the normal. And if the normal is at 45 degrees, then when I take sections of it, the layers are going to be equally spaced. So all I really care about is that the normal is always at 45 degrees to the z-axis. So any surface that has a normal, with, which is 45 everywhere, 45 degrees to the, to the z-axis, will have equally spaced layers. Okay? But now I'm doing low-dimensional geometry. 
Some of you may know. Sorry? It could be any number you like. Okay. All right. I'm going to work in units where 45 degrees is 1. Okay? So here I have this, I don't know, this is like the uh, Tropic of, um, it's the Tropic of Boston or something, right? It goes around at 45 degrees, right? And here's the cool thing. There's a theorem that says if you look at a surface and you watch it's normal, and you watch how it's normal moves around on this unit sphere, the area that the normal sweeps out <coughs> is the Gaussian curvature of the surface. But you notice that a, a surface that has a normal that only lives on this circle doesn't sweep out any area. It stays on the line. It doesn't fill in that gap. It just lives on that arc. No area. No Gaussian curvature. It turns out, two dimensions, there's enough stuff to show you that if it's no Gaussian curvature, it must be isometric to the plane. You can have this, or you can have this, or you can have this. You can have a plane, cones, which also have no Gaussian curvature except that they're a little point there, or you can take half a cone and attach it to planes off the back. Yes? I'm sorry. What are you doing with that sphere to get rid of the Gaussian curvature? I'm looking at the area that the normal sweeps out on the sphere. And it doesn't sweep out an area, it sweeps out a line. If you thought about the normal to a sphere, some other sphere, not that sphere, and you ask, what does that normal do on that sphere? It touches every point on that red sphere. As I move around the, 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 this other sphere in my head, right, it's normal, ends up pointing in every direction on that sphere. But here, if the normal is constrained to point along 23 degrees or 45 degrees, then it doesn't sweep out an area at all. And then this is the definition of the Gaussian curvature. So these are the only surfaces that can actually have that. And if you take sections of them, you get the no defect, the half defect, and the plus one defect. If you try to make a minus one half defect or a minus five half defect, and you wanted the layers to be equally spaced, you could not do it. Right? It's impossible. So these have very little compression. It turns out that what I just told you is a lie. <laughs> There's another surface, which we call Mr. Surface, because we read about it in her paper. Right? This is a piece of paper that you take, twist around and you kind of make a cone out of it, but there's a hole down the middle. You know, like if you eat that stuff, that stuff, what do you guys call it? candy floss? Uh, uh, cotton candy, right? You eat cotton candy, it'll come on this paper cone thing, but there's always a hole. You can never twist it up until it's really tight. So these are like, you know, wrapping a piece of paper. You can do this at home. You can do it with toilet paper tonight, okay? You can go around, wrap it, and you get this structure. And if you take sections of it, you get a, uh, a, a, a spiral. But the spiral is equally spaced. These distances are equally spaced, because this has no Gaussian curvature. It has a problem, it has a hole in the middle. But if you don't mind having a hole in the middle, these are also equally spaced surfaces. And they're related to something which I bet many of you own, and you don't know it. Okay? They're related to things called involutes. Involutes are very natural, right? And it's one of the most exciting things to do is to go to Europe and look for involutes. Okay? So here's a circle. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to draw five tangents to the circle. Okay? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw curves that are everywhere perpendicular to those tangents. Now this is really easy to do. How easy is this to do? Federico, do you know? Really easy. Really easy. You know how easy is a dog can do this? Okay? <laughs> because what you do is you take a dog and you put it on a leash and you wrap it around a tree. Okay? And then it unwraps itself. Always and the strong, always at highest tension, right? <laughs> yeah. And when it does that, that means that the, this, the, the line connecting the tree to where the dog is will be perpendicular to its path because it's always at highest tension. And as this unwinds, this will be the path the dog takes. And by construction, you notice these are all equally spaced. So here's another set of equally spaced layers that come from these involutes. Now, it turns out Many of you own involutes, all right? Many of you may be wearing some right now, okay? 
because it turns out gears are in loops. All right, this is the most genius thing. When I learned, read about this, I thought like these guys in the 1800s they knew everything. All right, you want to have teeth on two gears that don't rub against each other. You want them to touch exactly normal. All right. <clears throat> Not only does this shape, which is the involute shape of the teeth, make sure that they touch normally and don't shred on each other, it also means that the force that's acting across this thing is always in the same direction. So you can reinforce these two gears and you know exactly which way the thrust is going to be. In fact, circular saw blades are this shape also. So that it always pushes in the same direction. And here's the best part. Even if they didn't start this way, they would end this way. Right? They would grind themselves down until they stopped grinding. But they knew back in the 1800s to make trains this way. And if you go to Europe and you look at cog trains, you can look at the cog wheels, right? And the cog wheels are all in loops. <coughs> so we're almost done. <coughs> I'm going to go back to those uh, conic sections. So here's a picture. This is a picture taken with a camera phone. Okay? And I'm not talking about an 8 megapixel camera phone. I'm talking about one of those Motorola Razor flip phones all right? <coughs> from, the, uh, from the last century. Okay? And so here are these focal contact <coughs> domains. Here are these ellipses, a chain of ellipses. And if you look carefully, you see lines going through them, which turn out to be hyperbola going through them. Or in this case, it's degenerate. It can be a chain of circles with lines going straight up and down. Why do you see ellipses? Remember, I showed you that on the first slide. Here's a more standard picture that you look in every book. Here's a better picture that has these other lines going through them. These are hyperbola. These are ellipses. Why do you see them? And these have been seen forever. 1910. Okay? Is there a question? No? Okay, ask me if you have a question. Okay. So... Could you speak French? <laughs> No, but I actually looked at the paper, right? And it made the head pictures, right? So it was okay. It was like Dr. Susan. <laughs> so why do you see a conic section at all? And it turns out that the surface thing, which I use to explain the topology of the defect, is actually a useful device for understanding the geometry also. So I remember this. It's called PSSC Physics. Who learned from PSSC Physics? Nobody. Nobody? Oh, okay. Right? In the back of the, the back of the book had a picture. This is the most terrifying thing, okay? It's high school physics. This is when we taught physics last, not physics first. Okay? And you have this table with a glass tray, and there's water in it, and there are these two motors that are like poking on the water making waves, and you have a light shining down, you have paper, and you trace the pictures of the, of the, of the waves, right? You have 16-year-old vlog and electricity, all, all <laughs> emerging on the waves. And this is what you get. You get these waves. So this is my smectic, concentric circles. The mountains that make them are these cones. Now, if it were light, I know exactly what happens. When it's light, you get interference, and it's all very exciting. But these are smectics. These are real materials. So instead, they just crash and stop. OK? So look what happens. You have concentric circles that come together. They hit on a line. But what's happening in my space up above? In the space up above, I have two cones. And when the two cones intersect, they intersect on a hyperbola. Because the cones have the same angles. <clears throat> and what happens if one mountain's taller than the other? So these started before these. I still have concentric circles. They exactly crash into each other on a real hyperbola, on a non-degenerate hyperbola. That's coming from this. I throw away the top maps, and I just leave the bottom ones. And here's the hyperbola. same plane, the two hyperbola? I guess that's one hyperbola. This, yes, these are the two. But the top ones I throw out. So I'm just talking about the mountain ranges. So we realized something. I know this seems kind of dumb. And this is why I set 45 degrees to be 1. It turns out that's the same thing as setting the speed of light to be 1. Because we realized that this picture of surfaces was wrong. Saying that these surfaces lived in Euclidean space was wrong. 
And what we should do instead is we should write the equation for a cone in this stupid way. Minus phi squared plus x squared plus y squared equals zero. Phi is the height. And when I write it this way, I realize, of course, that this is the equation that light satisfies in Minkowski space. So if instead of thinking of this as Euclidean, I think of this as Minkowski space, this is a null surface, a light-like surface. And in 18-something or other, this Dutch guy, Lorentz, derived a full set of transformations that were, just, that were, that were derived specifically to preserve white cones. In fact, to preserve null surfaces. And so that means that if you give me one null surface, I can give you another null surface, which is also an equally spaced smectic. Right? Because every null surface gives me an equally spaced smectic, because it has the speed of light is 1, or sine of 45 degree angle. Of course, what happens when you boost a cone? What do you get? A cone of boredom. But it's not boring when you boost two cones. So here are two cones, okay? How would you describe this to a student taking special relativity? You'd say, ha ha, I have these two points here, and these two points are space-like separated, and their time interval, the delta t is zero. They're at the same time, space-like separated. And now you do a boost, and they're still space-like separated. But now, because you're in a moving frame, there are different times. And so that means that one's taller than the other. So it means that this and this are the same structure. Now you're going to say to me, when does this ever come up? When are you ever studying smectics while you're going near light speed? <laughs> I say, I'm not. I'm never doing that. But I'm interested in calculating the energetics. So isn't it convenient for me that I can use this simple coordinate system to study something? This is just a linear transformation. So I can make a linear transformation and now study a more complicated system. Better yet, I can study, for instance, the volcano. How would you describe this to a special relativity student? By the way, I was on this thesis defense, as an aside. I was on this thesis defense. I discovered there are two kinds of observers in special relativity. There, there are the observers who understand special relativity <laughs> and the observers that don't. <laughs> Anyhow. Here are two cones. They are the two. The two events are time-like separated. They're time-like. They're exactly at the same spatial point. I do a boost. They're still time-like separated. And now there's the ellipse. That's where the ellipse comes from. It comes from the intersection of cones. Now I have to tell you that the guy Friedel who first saw them was a genius. He knew when he saw ellipses and hyperbola then it must be because we have intersections of equally spaced surfaces. So he deduced the spectic from that geometry that you see under a regular microscope. All right, not from seeing the layers. It turns out, so these are related by a boost, those are related by a boost. Since my thing is not really special relativity, I can do things that mess up um, set causality. And there's another transformation called the special conformal transformation. It turns out all of these are the same. No, that so, doesn't mess causality, it messes distances, but not causality. What do you mean? It preserves the light cone. Right? Yes, what but, but doesn't it change, change t minus t? Can things become... Well, not the connected part. Okay, but this might... Okay, all right, well, Even I stand corrected. It does something, but we don't do it, right? When we teach special relativity, why don't we do it? Because it preserves the light cone, but not the distance. Okay, thank you. <coughs> They're still all the same. All right, here's the transformation. All of these structures are these. So I can start with this very simple geometry and then evaluate the energies or anything I want about these things. If I want to study fluctuations around this structure, I can make linear transformation back to that one. Now what happens if you want to go to three dimensions? Because that's the real dimension ring. Well, one thing you could do is you could take those things and you could rotate them around the line of symmetry so that you have now, instead of two circles intersecting on a hyperbola, two spheres intersecting on a hyperboloid. Or you could have two sets of concentric spheres intersecting on an ellipsoid. But there's something better that happens in three dimensions. Because this is terrible. 
Because now I have a whole wall, a whole surface, where the energy is bad, where there's a place where the molecules don't know which way to point. By the way, that's why you can see them. Those ellipses you saw, you saw them without the aid of cross polarizers. It's because it's a place where the dielectric constant jumps, because the molecule direction jumps suddenly, and that's what scatters light. That's the focal, and that's the comic. They're called focal comic domains. But you can do something else. You can actually take a structure, and you can show, using special relativity, that if you take an ellipse and a hyperbola, and the ellipse goes through the hyperbola, the ellipse goes through the focus of the hyperbola, and the hyperbola goes through the focus of the ellipse, and they're in perpendicular planes, and that's all represented here in this nice, you know, special relativity way. You can show that these layers then, that I'm drawing, these are not the green layers, these are the actual layers in three-dimensional space, are level sets of a four-dimensional light cone. Three plus long, not two plus long. Which I'm not going to draw because I can't. But it turns out, of course, this is just the Lorentz transformation of this. And this we completely understand. Concentric tori. I can do this with a donut, right? You take a donut, you keep dipping it in chocolate, eventually the chocolate gets stuck in the middle and you get this other cusp, which is that line. And when you do the Lorentz transformation, the line becomes a hyperbola and the circle becomes an ellipse. So that's what you see. And this is called a focal conic domain. So here's a picture of one from a real experiment, right? 20 microns, it's big. Here's Mathematica's version of it. Okay. And what's it good for? It turns out that you can take this focal conic domain and you can put it in a cone. And what Friedel understood a long time ago was that you can take concentric spheres and you can take a wedge, a conical wedge, out of the concentric spheres and shove this thing in. And when you shove it in, the layers here match the layers here. They're tangent, they're parallel to each other. So there's no discontinuity in the direction of the molecules. So it's smooth, you don't see anything. All you see is that there's a region where now something's different. And you can then build spheres around it. And you can take as many regions of concentric spheres as you want, pluck out whole cones, and shove back in these focal conic domains. And it'll all match very smoothly and nicely. Here's a picture of one. Right? So here's a sphere, and it, it, the sphere, it turns out the surface is like to have negative Gaussian curvature instead of positive Gaussian curvature. But you get this sphere that's studded with all these focal conic domains. And those are, the, those are the things coming out. You can actually take a bunch of them together and build a grain boundary out of them in a symmetric. You don't have to just have a wall like in a crystal. You can actually glue them together. These are ones that are boosted. So then you have these two asymptotic directions, which are the hyperbole, and you can actually build layers that way. Symmetric layers. So you can have a grain boundary where the layers are like this here and the layers are like that there. And they are joined by these focal lines. And you might say to me, well, what goes in between these holes? Smaller focal conic domains. And between those, even smaller ones. You get an Apollonian packing of focal conic domains. But we did something else. Here's the reply. We took a single sphere. And we put it in a smectic, and it made a meniscus. Yes. And now you have a situation where the top surface wants to have the layers parallel to the surface, and the bottom surface wants to have the layers perpendicular. It's called hybrid anchoring. And so the layers have to go from being like this on the bottom to bending up on the top. But they have to bend different amounts as you go <coughs> along the surface, because the surface is curved. And what you end up getting is you end up getting a completely self-assembled set of focal conic domains that are bigger in the middle because they have to have more eccentricity and they get smaller and smaller as you go out and eventually the layers just become fine. <coughs> so you can actually build this, right? And you can look under cross polarizers and you can see where those points are. So what are those reddish kind of lines above, no, no, lower left figure? That's just a sphere. You got like what yeah, that's the liquid, top. liquid up against the sphere or something? Yeah, that's probably some microscope. This is, this is, oh sorry, this is a height profile, probably by some kind of, probably AFM, 
right, to get the high profile. <clears throat> so my student, Dan Beller, came up with this very brilliant way of constructing arbitrarily complex surfaces. So you see, here are the concentric spheres. You cut out a wedge, you replace it with these pieces of focal conic domain. But then he said, oh, but I can then take that and make another wedge and fill it back in with spheres. And I can keep doing that. I can make it again and again. And so I can actually pattern any arbitrary surface shape. And doing that, he actually came up with a very nice model of what the structure was so that we could control it. And so here we did something. We used them to make lenses. So this is work that Francesca Serra led. See the letter P? It's for pen, OK? Letter P. We get the letter P. This. What we're changing is we're changing where we're focusing. So when we focus down low, the ones that are closer to being small, that are closer to being the flat surface, we get the P here. It's the same letter P. There's only one letter P. Then as we focus out and we go to higher heights, we get the P's focused around here, and then finally they come out here. So we actually have a multifocal lens that self-assembles. All right? And if you mess it up, it reheals itself. And if you heat it up and cool it back down, it it heals itself. And you don't have to do it on a flat surface. You can do it on any surface you want. We can transfer it onto this capillary. Capillary seems to be popular. Okay. Even better, because these focal conic domains are elliptical, they actually are sensitive to polarized light. So we put polarized smiley faces in. And you can see that on the side, we only get polarization this way. So we have a picture of a smiley face. And then on the top, up here, we only get it with the polarizations like that. So we made a compound lens, a multifocal compound lens that detects polarization. Is it how a bug does it? No. But it's how we do it. Okay? We're not bugs. So uh, these are the main people who worked on the theory with me. Like I said, Francesca Serra well, led that last experiment. And um, thank you for your time. show you. When we took this picture, this was a sample that had sat for 20 years. These are big. These are quite big. You can see them in your eye. All right. Because they could have formed in five seconds. No, they didn't. They, they didn't. Years. No, no, they didn't. You have to wait a long time. They course in very slowly. But these pictures that I showed you, the very first picture that I showed you, this one, that's, that's a more standard one that you just see, right? And when we look at, when we look at the movies of our eyes, we can film them, temp, you know, raising and lowering the temperature. They form in a few seconds. A few seconds. Yeah, a few seconds. In the movie. 
and discussion, which is also just a very short time. Well, it, it's a, what do you mean it's a short time? It depends. It takes long to go with the calendar. They're like 100 microns, right? Yeah. <coughs> the whole pattern. It has to cool. It has to cool down from the <coughs> pneumatic phase into the symmetric phase. It has to order. There's a latent heat for that. And then it assembles, again, back repeatedly into that one structure. But I don't know very much about the dynamics. But that's, again, about the gradient terms. The gradient terms can make some force. That's correct. It's not as exotic as the pitch drop experiment, but it's, it's getting there, right? Because this picture that I showed you from Boulder, that was 20 years old when I took it, but that's not 10 years ago, so you know, 30 years old. So, you know, it's gotten bigger. The picture hasn't changed. The picture hasn't changed, but the sample has. <laughs> Earth rotates. Are there, are there people who investigate the dynamics, for example, by if you drove a, a very fine wire through this picture, and I'm thinking about like the fluid dynamics stuff that it's, that it's done uh, here to some extent. Can you get can you get dynamical formation of, of things that such as are seen in the So they do that in pneumatic liquid crystals, which have this orientation, uh -huh. right? And a lot of people who study active flowing things study active pneumatics. Yeah. I don't know anybody who's yet studied active smectics, right? My guess is it would be very difficult. Study because what would happen is the crystal order would keep breaking up. It would just melt into the pneumatic as you pull the wire through. But you could certainly ask what happens if you try to flow a smectic in the directions that it doesn't support shear. Could you have a nice aligned thing and have it flow past something or not? It'd be like a cookie. Right? right? Can, can you, but you can imagine, could it flow past it and come back together and not, and not be disturbed on the other side? Did you design the, uh, the eyes, or was this, an, is this something that happened experimentally? Oh, so we have a, we had this uh, very, very postdoc with excellent hands, Mohammed Garbi, who, you know, I'm not, even, I'm not sure he did it on purpose even. He just wanted to know what would happen. He put this drop of, <coughs> this grain of sand, right, on the thing, and he saw the structure. He was very careful, very clever experimental. Well, you did design the smiley faces. The sm oh, that was, that was when we were doing optics. No, 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 it wasn't me. I wouldn't have made a smiley face. <laughs> uh, are there other questions? So we should retire upstairs and have some Hawaiian cheese. <laughs>